so uh, what exactly uh, you know before we uh, discuss in detail what exactly uh, like you know the aspects of acoustic communication in frogs i would like to give uh, a brief insights about what exactly is uh, animal uh, communication so uh, let's start with uh, that so if you look at an animal communication and if you look at the communication system that uh, animals have so uh, what exactly like you know there are a few major components in a communication system so like i can just uh, take the example of, of frogs where you have a signaler like uh, which uh, the job of the signal is to produce a signal and uh, which can move through a medium like uh, in case of amphibians the medium is generally air air as a medium uh, but we do have some frogs which uh, communicate underwater but uh, like majority of amphibians uh, it's through air and then you have an intended receiver like where uh, what is like meant for the like what is the signal meant for like it goes to the receiver so the, and that is how uh, generally a communication system in an animal works so uh, moving ahead uh, like talking about the second aspects and how how uh, different uh, behavioral ecologists have uh, defined a communication system like uh, many times you can uh, find this as the definition for a communication system like you know something which basically reduces the uncertainty of the receivers you know so uh, like uh, when a uh, when a signal is producing signal it is definitely intended towards a certain kind of receiver uh, like you know of its con specific and obviously it will help pass on the information which the signaler wants to give to the receiver and obviously that will help uh, the receiver to you know have some you know idea about what exactly is uh, the signaler uh, like like what is the interest of the signaler and many people argue upon different definitions uh, there are also uh, definitions especially in case of amphibian system like uh, uh, a signal which basically manipulate the behavior of the receiver like if you look at this particular definition that means uh, if you look at frogs uh, acoustic system uh, you know, mostly in frogs, you have males who produces the call, and it is basically trying to manipulate the behavior of the female. Basically, you know that in amphibians, uh, females are uh, generally not producing any kind of sound, and they are uh, just there to, you know, um, like hear the sound and you know choose the mates accordingly, uh, based on what, uh, like you know, she has the, she can choose the uh, right mate based on the calls of the males. I can discuss that later on in the presentation, how, what exactly females are looking for. So that is also one aspect because uh, that is, then uh, sometimes uh, people also give, uh, talk about communication system as a medium where, you know, which provides an exchange of information between the, uh, you know, signaler and the uh, receiver. So if you look at a frog uh, system, you have a signaler basically, which uh, is a male and, uh, and what exactly that signal is telling to it's con specific like you know i'm a male generally because in uh, in frogs generally you have male who uh, communicate produces the sound so what does it the signal of the frogs uh, tell to the intended receiver that i am a male i belong to this particular species this is my body size and this is the location from where i am calling this is the information which a animal is uh, like um, uh, generally an amphibian is trying to communicate and what exactly is the receivers decoding from the sound that is being produced by the uh, con specific uh, male uh, it is uh, like like wh what are they hearing like you know if you look at the receivers receivers could be either male or a female like generally uh, you know when a frog is making a sound it is also uh, being heard by the other males which are there in the vicinity so obviously males will also be the receiver and uh, females of that particular species uh, is also receiving and based on the uh, uh, the information that is coming from the male uh, the females will choose uh, you know the partner so uh, what is it telling you know like uh, because you know in frogs there can be uh, you know very noisy choruses which can comprise of different species so what will it tell it will tell uh, whether the species that they are hearing is uh, same or it is, it is a different species, whether the individual uh, uh, that is uh, producing the sound is big or small, I can explain later on how, and uh, what is the location or position from where the sound is coming. That is 
something that uh, the receivers uh, judge based on the you know, sound which they are hearing. So the third aspect of the communication system I want to highlight is the questions. You know, basically, what exactly uh, we look, uh, you know, in, like based on what we ask questions. You know, so what exactly is the most important thing in a communication system? Like first, uh, you know. If you look at an amphibian uh, or a, any communication system, uh, it is fundamental to all behavioral interaction between animals. You know, any animal. You know, I, I mean, you can see that they basically vocalize. You may or may not understand, but the uh, the the species that is making the sound is able to communicate to the other members of the same species based on the sounds which they produce. So that is what fascinates the behavioral ecologist, and they go looking for, you know, understand what exactly is the signal being used. You know, a lot of information uh, um, they try to interpret by various experiments because obviously behavioral interaction is one of the most uh, fundamental way of uh, interaction between animals, uh, be it birds or mammals or uh, frogs. Uh, all of these uh, animal systems you have. Uh, vocal communication, which is present as one of the most fundamental way by which an animal interacts, and again, uh, you know, like due to advancement in research, the second aspects uh, have has also come up. Like you know, many neuroscientists uh, work on this aspects, like how uh, you know when a when a receiver uh, receives the signal from a intended uh, a partner or a one specific male. Uh, like what? How exactly the brain responds to those signals, and what exactly is the sound that the particular uh, you can always always decode what kind of aspects of the call uh, the receiver wants to hear. You know, so you know we, we we can try and interpret various functions of various kinds of sound which an animal produces based on those uh, you know system, uh, like if, by doing these kind of experimental studies. Um, then uh, you have. Uh, Um, something is wrong. Right. So we can. Uh, can you see? Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, like uh, like coming uh, talking about frogs. Uh, um, like uh, you can. Uh, I, I would like to list some of the advantages why people uh, try to study. Uh, you know, amphibian uh, communication system. So there are multiple reasons for that. The first reason is uh, frogs are very vocal. You know, they are one of the most vocal vertebrates. You might, you are aware of that probably. Like uh, they can produce, you know, they continuously call, especially during the mating season, to attract a mate. Like if you go out in the field at night, you can hear n number of species of frogs. And the only thing that they're doing that particular time of night is that they're making sound and the sound is for very specific reason that they want to attract their mate so like that's one of the primary reasons why they're vocalizing so they are very vocal so you can easily go and hear the frogs when the, you are out there in the field so that is one of the most uh, you know it becomes very um, uh, you know it's very interesting because uh, you can basically record large quantities of sound from these amphibians and then you can use it for uh, various scientific studies if you record them properly. Uh, then the second important aspect of uh, a neuron vocal communication is they have a very limited repertoire. If you uh, if you look at other uh, signaling systems like in mammals or in birds, you know that they have more complex uh, vocalizations. And uh, frogs, if they have limited repertoire, you can easily try and interpret what exactly that signal uh, is uh, being produced for like you know uh, many of those mammalian uh, or in birds thus uh, you know if, even if you record large varieties of sound it's very difficult to decode what exactly the sound is being produced for that particular species so there are multiple reasons uh, why amphibian becomes an interesting subject this is also one of the interesting subject uh, which makes it more interesting is that they don't have many varieties of sounds and the sounds that they have, they produce in large quantity. Like, you know, you can go out and see frogs and you can record them, you know. So that is one of the most important aspects. The third important aspect that I want to highlight here is playback experiment. Frogs are also known to be highly responsive to playback experiments. Highly responsive means, uh, you know, they can, uh, 
you know if you do a playback experiment like you know uh, um, to understand what is that signal being produced for you can get a lot of response from the con specifics which you are intended to you know if you do that experiment whether in the field or in the lab you can see a lot of responses you can see a lot of research being done on playback experiments based on uh, amphibians so uh, they respond and so that helps you decode uh, many aspects of their behavior so that is why it becomes very interesting to study uh, a neuron uh, vocal uh, communication system another important aspect is uh, the fitness of the population right you know if you are a ecologist and you want to uh, think uh, like you know uh, what is the you know uh, uh, you know that if you go out in the field at night uh, near to a water body you will hear large quantities of frogs calling if that water body is uh, you know suitable habitat for a particular species why because uh, you know continuously you can uh, get those data and information without doing much effort because uh, you can always estimate uh, whether that population uh, is you know continuing like that or there is a decline or you know many aspects will come and it will give you a lot of information about the fitness of a particular population of the species so it, it becomes an important aspect in uh, uh, conservation also uh, then uh, talking about evolutionary studies uh, you know many many uh, evolutionary biologists are also uh, fascinated by these amphibians so like you know how uh, what is the basic boundary between closely closely related species uh, how is it maintained so how the boundaries are maintained and vocalization have been found to be one of the most important parameters for uh, you know evolutionary studies uh, why because uh, you know if you look at uh, 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 frogs uh, if you see uh, one of the major reasons you know acoustic communication serves as you know we call it as pre mating reproductive isolation you know that as i was telling uh, that uh, you know species of a particular species only respond to the speech calls of their con specifics that's a very well known fact so even if you have like more than 20 30 species of frogs living together you know if you go to rainforest you will have n number of frogs which are calling everywhere in the forest but uh, the calls of a particular species uh, like you know the con specific response only to the calls or even in, even in loud choruses they respond only to the calls of their own uh, con specifics so there are a lot of reasons why it fascinates uh, uh, you know uh, many evolutionary biologists and uh, how closely related and for example how closely related species tend to share their uh, you know uh, like vocal repertoire how the you know vocalizations and uh, like has it have evolved in uh, you know closely related species and how like many things you can study another as i was just telling you the same thing i'm repeating again like species identification so vocalization is an important aspect which helps us ident identify a you know particular frog because every species has their own unique sound and like for example uh, you're looking at the picture uh, on my screen right now it's a frog uh, of uh, it's a tree frog of genus raorchestus and you might have you might remember the first slide i showed you uh, while i started my presentation so they both very look very similar you saw a brown frog in the beginning of my presentation and you are seeing a frog right now uh, in this particular slide on the top of my screen so they basically look very similar to each other but uh, they were two different species of bush frogs right so and uh, sound can actually help you identify them if you are uh, doing studies on their acoustics you can easily identify even if morphology is conserved and it's very confusing for you to uh, go out in the field and you know and uh, you know you know it will help you identify if you have the acoustic data for that particular species i think it's one of the easiest way to identify uh, frogs because uh, you know if you do a genetic study it will take a lot of time you know you go out you do the molecular analysis and you identify frogs but if you know if you have the acoustic data the information comes very instantly you know you can understand the species morphology can be very very confusing for many species which are closely related so a lot of reasons are there you know all of these factors makes uh, vocal communication in amphibians a very important subject and it helps uh, um, even taxonomist in species identification so these are some of the important aspects why frogs become an interesting subject uh to study their vocalization like it's a very interesting subject and you know to study their vocalization is like very interesting so uh 
so another important aspect that I want to go ahead, you know, that I, I was telling you that amphibians are very vocal. They produce you know, large, uh, like, two, like different kinds of sounds. Also, like they, they, there are not too many sounds, but uh, certain species can have like produce sounds which can perform different functions, right? So I want to highlight uh, some of those types of calls which uh, frogs are, you know, have been published or uh, mostly based on my experience. So whatever I'm trying to show right now is uh, like uh, based on my experience in the field. So I'm trying to show videos and photographs of species that I have encountered in the field and if uh, and what kind of sounds uh, they produce and whether there is uh, uh, you know any species which i have not seen probably from our country uh, if there is an evidence of such kind of call from uh, outside india so all of those aspects uh, i want to uh, cover by you know while discussing the types of calls uh, which are produced by amphibians so the first one uh, is uh, the most common one, which you will hear all the time, the advertisement call, or sometimes people refer to them as mating calls. Uh, but I, advertisement call is one of the most widely used terminologies because uh, 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 if you look at the uh, uh, you know, uh, advertisement call of a particular species, it can have more than one function, right? Mating call uh, just refers to the fact that the calls which are being produced by frogs, uh, they are being produced only to attract a mate. But that is not the only function uh, that a call might have, you know, because that's why it, it can have more than one function. For example, it can also tell a rival male, which who wants to compete with that particular male, the presence of where that particular male is present, you know, and uh, you know they can assess a lot of they can have a lot of assessments which. I'm anyways going to discuss later on. So they can assess based on the information that they are gathering from the call. So it has, since it has more than one function, we uh, typically call this as uh, advertisement calls, which you generally hear when you go out there in the field and you hear a lot of frogs calling. That is what we call as uh, the advertisement call. Uh, second, um, like I can just give you an example because uh, uh, if you look at this, uh, particular species it's a very interesting one it's a uh, first i would like to give some idea about what exactly i'm going to show it's a species of a uh, burrowing frog from our country which is uh, belonging to genus uh, sperotheca so uh, it's a very very sensitive animal you know if you try and go near the animal it uh, basically uh, stops vocalizing you know i have been trying to record uh, or videograph this animal for quite some time but you know that uh, uh, I only got it this year. 2020 is a very unique year. You all are, you all are aware of this. So this is the year when I managed to record it because every time when I used to go close to, even when you are five meters away from the animal, they used to stop calling. They can easily sense your presence. But luckily, this year I managed to have a you know sit next to the frog and you know make the video of this particular species calling. So uh, you know just hear the sound if you are able to, because uh, since uh, I think audio is not going directly, I'm playing it on my phone as well, uh, just to make you hear the sound of this particular uh, this interesting species. Can you hear? Uh, no, sir. Um, I don't know if it's just for me, uh, but I could not hear it. Yeah, now okay. Okay, I'll try to time the videos when it plays on my screen on my phone together. Right. So probably you heard the sound like what you saw in the video. Yes. Uh, yeah. So anyways, I can give you one more example. You know, it was a frog which was uh, like uh, it's another interesting species which I uh, managed to videograph uh, this year. It's a species of tree frog which is. Uh, uh, which I, uh, which we have the relatives of this frog in India as well, but this one is from uh, Borneo. And listen to the way this animal is uh, uh, vocalizing. I hope you guys can hear it. Yes, sir. yes sir. Yeah. So uh, this is also a, you know, I'm I'm just trying to give you more examples to, uh, you know, for that you know, interest you. 
It also tells you the fact that uh, you heard two species of frogs and they had completely different vocalization, right? So this is one of the important aspects that I was trying to highlight that uh, frogs uh, will have uh, different vocalizations and uh, it varies from species to species. That's why I decided to play. You will hear more frogs in different contexts and that will also give you further more ideas about, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, different can acoustics uh, of various species can be. Uh, let's, let's move ahead with the different uh, call type. Um, what happens is, I don't know what, uh, sometimes the videos, uh, sorry, the transition is not happening, because, so I have to exit and come back. Uh, yeah, so this is the second, uh, uh, so you guys have to tell me if you, there is any problem in seeing or viewing uh, the screen, you know, so yes, that, uh, yeah, so that I can, uh, you know, uh, react upon it accordingly. So it's a, it's a, it's a photo of a, a bush frog that is, there in, in, in an aggressive interaction. Uh, you can see the picture here. So this is another type of uh, vocalization that frogs produce. Like, uh, you know, um, they can increase their rate of call or they can produce an entirely different sound when they interact with a male of, a sim of their own species. So, uh, I mean, I can show you uh, some examples of aggressive territorial calls of some of our Indian frogs. Uh, uh, so that you can have more ideas. So you can easily see the context when it is being produced. Uh, so this is, uh, my God. Um, okay. Yes. It's So you can easily see this is uh, a male night frog. This is from one of our published work, uh, which was on the breeding behavior of uh, this particular species. Uh, yeah, and uh, we we highlighted the the male male combat of that particular species. And uh, this is another interesting. You saw the first picture when I was talking about territorial calls. So this is the same species in a different location. So this video shows you uh, the the basically uh, it's it's a different kind of experience you will have because here you can see a frog a uh, properly wrestling like uh, you know humans. So you, please uh, look at the video. So uh, this was a video which showed the territorial, uh, you know, the calls of uh, that particular species. Uh, that is, uh, the, the species in the video was uh, Pseudophilatus species from our Western Ghats. And this is the third uh, kind of call that I want to talk about, that is the courtship call. The species in the picture is just for telling you when is the courtship call being produced? This species actually doesn't have courtship call, not that I know of. So it is just for the reference, but I can give you an example of a species that I was lucky to have worked on in North America, which basically has courtship calls. So I can show you some pictures of that particular species. This is the photograph of spring peeper, which is a frog, uh, which I, this one, I photographed in, uh, uh, Minnesota, which is in the United States, and they are breeding as soon as the snow melts in spring season in, in because it's a very cold place. So that is the time as soon as the snow melts, uh, they start breeding and they breed like, you know, you can hear loud, large number of males gathering together in the water body and 
making loud sounds and it is uh, very popularly known as spring peeper which name itself tells you that it breeds in the spring and uh, this has uh, you know whatever they are making the, the, this the, what what people have like what uh, the behavioral ecologists who have studied this particular species they have found out that this particular uh, species in the presence of a female before they go into amplexus uh, the the length of their call changes it increases in length so they are basically responding to the presence of female uh, which is there nearby so and they refer to these calls because it is different from the normal advertisement call which the species normally produce so that's why this particular call has been termed as uh, courtship calls we haven't encountered any species in our country like i have not made and i have not seen any published records of course courtship calls of species uh, from our country from anyone else so that's why i cannot cite an example from our country so i'm giving you examples which i mean i have witnessed this species in north america and after their courtship they go into amplexes like this um so i'm sorry for this hazy image which is there but you know when you're working in those conditions uh, you can see this is how you have to work because it's too cold outside like uh, it's the temperature is below sub zero most of the time and you are basically in the water which is at zero degrees uh, trying to you know so you, you you cannot be stable you know sometimes your camera shakes it's very difficult to be stable and you have to spend a lot of time in the water to get close to uh, so this is the difficulties which you have in north america while you're working on frogs it becomes too cold uh, another uh, as another uh, kind of vocalization um, i don't know what happens all the time yeah so this is another kind of call which is produced by uh, certain species because you know as i was t t telling you in the beginning that in frogs you have mostly the uh, the males that produces the sound so what happens is uh, uh, you know in, in if you look at the data from the world wide you know publications by various uh, researchers from all across the world you can see that uh, you have uh, Uh, you know less than 0.5% of the species of frogs where females are actually making any kind of sound so it is uh, so that's why it's highly unknown uh, about a female uh, producing the sound so this is one of the species that uh, like i encountered uh, while we were working in uh, uh, in maharashtra which is the night frog species again it's a published work uh, it's our published work and uh, you can hear clearly so you can clearly see in the video uh, of this particular species uh, i'll talk more about it once you hear the so the um, audio is not okay so this is what happens you know sometimes uh when you need uh, the technology to function properly it doesn't work it, it it makes it a point to not work when it's needed the most i guess yeah yeah so uh wait i will just go back and i'll try to make you listen to this particular sound no problem sir so, yeah yeah yes sir we have already gone through the video it's still there on the screen yeah so uh, yeah so that was female call as i was telling about that uh, species like uh, you know this is uh, one of the first uh, published information about the female call from our country like we don't really encounter uh, these kind of uh, 
um, vocalization in females from species which we have in our country. So another interesting uh, kind of vocal behavior that frogs have is like, you know, the release call. So uh, again, uh, I, I have not encountered these vocalizations in our country, but this is again a photograph that I'm showing you is a species from North America that I have managed to, uh, you know, uh, you know, do some field work on. And this is the, the famous wood frog, you know, it's very famous in the scientific community because it is known to seize its heart, uh, you know, stop its heartbeat while it is hibernating in the winters. And all. So, you know, so, uh, I mean, I have not looked into how, because I mean, that's not my domain of the work, but I mean, I'm, it's popular information about these, uh, this particular species. So release call is sometimes like uh, this particular species is uh, called as an explosive breeder means as soon as the ice melts, they, the breeding season lasts only for a very limited time. Uh, so the, all of these males uh, come together and uh, uh, they try and vocalize and, uh, you know, they lay eggs uh, and then they vanish. You know, the breeding season lasts only for a few days. So you will not be encountering these frogs throughout the year, only for certain days in the year when they are vocalizing and... Uh, but they will be doing a lot of activities during those days, so you can easily go and see. So I was lucky to be there so exactly for those days when these uh, frogs were mating because, uh, you know, uh, you don't encounter these species breeding all the time in the year. So what is release call? It's like, uh, as I said, it was it's an explosive breeding species. So what happens is that uh, the males are actively moving in their breeding pond and they grab onto anything that moves in front of them. So they accidentally sometimes grabs a... a you know, a male of a same species. So then the male of the other species will make a unique kind of sound to tell them that, you know, I'm not the right one that you're looking for. I'm not a female. So please release me. Even if you put your finger in the water and you can shake your hand in the water, they will come and grab onto your hand thinking that it's a female. So they're just looking randomly uh, for a mate if the mate is not coming to them and they just try to hold on to anything. So they just want to be lucky if they can grab a female while they're moving around. And sometimes a female also will produce a release call uh, if they don't uh, want to be involved with that particular male, you know, if they have not selected, you know, uh, it, it, it works like that in an amphibian mating system. So they can simply uh, uh, ask the, uh, you know, the partner who has climbed onto it uh, to just leave. So th that time you will hear a unique kind of sound, which is called as the release call, it means release me. So I'm not uh, interested, something like that. So these are the two conditions where you will hear uh, this particular sound. Uh, we haven't encountered, I have not encountered a uh, similar kind of, uh, you know, in, in our country. Uh, yeah, this is just for representation, uh, alarm call. I mean, uh, it's one of the, one of the rare calls. Uh, we don't have anything like that uh, known from our country. This photograph that you see is just for representing when an alarm call is being produced, like when there is a snake in the vicinity of certain species, uh, they tend to produce, uh, you know, alarm call. Uh, I mean, uh, as far as I remember, a good example would be, uh, you know, a bull, American bullfrog. Uh, so those species are known to produce alarm call if they encounter a predator and they, uh, you know, they, they are out on the, on the uh, outside the water body, they will make a unique kind of sound and they will jump in the water. That's what uh, it has been described. It ha it is, that is how it has been described. So they produce alarm calls. I mean, American bullfrogs are known to produce uh, alarm calls, but it's a very unique kind of rare vocalization, which many, I mean, like, we, we, which we don't encounter all the time in the field. We don't have any species that we currently know of from our country by anyone who have studied vocalizations uh, of presence of alarm calls in a species. Uh, then, um, yeah, this is another uh, rare call. Uh, again, we haven't encountered anything like this in India. This photograph is just to show what is an amplexus. This species is a skipper frog. It doesn't have any amplexus call, but I'm just trying to show what exactly is an amplexus. So what the one example that I give, give for an amplexus call is an American toad, which is Bufum uh, Americanus, which basically is known to produce, uh, uh, you know, call while it is in amplexus. So people, uh, you know, hypothesize, hypothesize that the calls that they produce while they are am in amplexus is to stimulate the female to lay the eggs. So it's all in hypothesis, but that is exact functions of these calls we are not aware of. 
right now. But yeah, I mean, these are the scientific hypotheses which people need to figure out, like what exactly is the intended reason why they make sounds. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we don't re really see a frog calling in our country. We haven't encountered, I mean, uh, nor that I've heard from anyone that they have encountered any frogs that they call while they are in amplexes. So, I mean, I just gave you an example, which is, uh, it's an old literature that uh, tells that Bufo americanus uh, produces uh, calls while they're in amplexes. Maybe there are other species also. Um, so uh, this is uh, another work, kind of vocalization, like which a frogs produce, uh, which is called as stress call. So you can easily see the picture on the screen. Uh, it is being produced when the animal is uh, being eaten by a predator. So uh, this is a photograph uh, from our country where a uh, uh, Minervaria species is being eaten by uh, a striped keelback. And, uh, you know, I, you know that f snakes are generally, uh, you know, when, if you look at these, this particular snake and the frog, when I saw it for the first time, I never realized that snakes can swallow the such big frogs, you know, all the time, this particular, when I was making this video, the frog was making sound and that's how I was able to locate, uh, you know, this particular predation. So, and, uh, you know, you can have a look of, and you can hear the, you know, um, um, wait. Can you hear the sound? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, this video I shot in my own house, so I was lucky that it was happening in my house. Okay. Fine, so you have uh, just heard about uh, all kinds of uh, you know, the signals that signalers produce. So now I want to uh, talk a bit about the sexual selection in uh, amphibians. You know, you might be aware of this particular term. You know, it was a theory which was given long back by uh, Darwin, uh, sexual selection. You know, you, you are very much familiar with the birds, right? You know that birds have, uh, in, in birds, you see males, especially uh, male birds, they have very bright and beautiful plumage, which makes them attractive to the female and female choose uh, males based on that, like, you know, you know, you know, the peacock, peacock's tail has eyes, uh, which uh, the number of eyes determines whether that particular male is going to uh, get the partner or not like that. There are plenty of species. So they have various methods uh, by which they undergo uh, sexual selection. And uh, if you look at uh, sexual selection in amphibians, uh, we have uh, both the aspects here. You know, we have intersexual selection and intrasexual selection. I, I mean, I will explain what exactly is intersexual selection and intrasexual selection. Intersexual selection means female mate choice. That means, uh, you know, when a male produces the sound, the female is able to uh, assess that particular quality of the sound. Uh, is the video stopped for everybody else also? Uh, the second aspect that is intrasexual selection, that is, uh, uh, you know, sometimes male and male interact with each other and they, you know, 
I've, I've showed you some videos of males which are fighting with each other. So you know, two males fighting and trying to prove that they are dominant and choose the right territory for uh, him. So that is the intra. So so intermale competition basically is intrasexual uh, selection. So that is very that is also there in amphibians. So both the things you can see in this particular uh, group of animals. Then uh, let me talk about uh, certain things that a female look while she is, uh, you know, what is published. You know, I'm basically talking based on the literatures that we have uh, from all across the world, which tells us about what exactly the female is looking for in a particular, uh, you know, species. Uh, like uh, in that particular species, when they are trying to identify a, a partner. So, uh, like one one of the important factors here is, uh, you know. Female generally go for av average values. You know what is an average value? That means uh, it's like the mean, mean values of various call parameters that you study. So that is what we call as the average value. Uh, that means uh, in this is happening in certain kind of species, certain species of amphibians. Uh, that means average value will actually best represent the species. That is what is uh, being deduced from this. Like you know values which are in the center. So that will be the best representative of the species. So they will go for the average values. Then uh, certain species are known to go for a males that are calling at a faster rate. You know, uh, males that has more number of call in a short period of time. So the call rates of the species or the pulses that the sounds that they produce, if that is faster, uh, it has been also studied that certain species go for uh, uh, males that call at a rapid rate. So that is another aspect of uh, you know sexual selection in amphibians. Then you have uh, certain species are also known to uh, uh, choose a mate based on their call length. You know that, that means uh, females will choose a male which has longer calls compared to the males which has shorter calls. So that is also one of the factors which basically determines uh, uh, female mate selection in the um, amphibians then another aspect of uh, uh, female sexual selection is uh, call complexity so i mean i have already pointed out that amphibians don't have uh, uh, like very many number of ways by which they make sound but there are certain species which has more complex calls so um, you know in those species females will go uh, for the males which has more complex vocal repertoire so that is also that has also been studied so, so I mean, there are a few examples of those species which uh, has complicated vocal repertoires, where a mate choice happens based on how complex the calls that a male is being uh, male is producing. Then um, another aspect of uh, uh, female uh, sexual selection uh, is a uh, mate choice is uh, the frequency. You know, uh, frequency as I was telling in the beginning, that frequency tells a lot about the size of the uh, you know the male that is making the sound so you know, if you have a larger male uh, it is uh, producing calls at a lower dominant frequency it has been widely studied in amphibians even from the frogs that we have studied it has similar kind of pattern so uh, uh, female uh, some it, it's known uh, like female is known to prefer males that are larger in size so that means uh, you know they go for the calls which are uh, lower in uh, dominant frequency so that is also something that you hear in uh, amphibians, you know. So this is another aspect of, uh, you know, um, females, the way she chooses her partner. So, I mean, all of these factors are like, these are the things that is present, like currently that we know of what exactly the females are looking for in, I mean, various uh, amphibian models that have been studied in the world. So based on that, I have given you the information. Then uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, um, you know, if you are talking about female uh, mate choice, uh, like uh, in amphibians, so people have also studied that a female that chooses the right partner with some of these qualities, they are having offsprings which are of higher quality. That has also been studied. So all of these gives you a lot of evidence why female go for males. You know, basically the calls tells a lot about the genetic fitness of the male. So that is why females are responsive. Uh, to those males which have some of these aspects that I've just discussed. So that is an important aspect in the you know mate uh, selection system that exists in the amphibians. So uh, 
I mean, if you go through literatures, you will find all of these things, uh, which uh, you know researchers have published from all across the world. Then uh, another important aspect of uh, sexual selection in amphibians. I mean, I just talked about the female response. Now there is also a response from uh, uh, um, the male, which is there next to a male, which is making the sound. So you can easily understand that that particular thing also exists. A call also tells a rival male that uh, you know, rival males can assess the body size of the male that is calling next to it. So basically, in, in, in scientific term, it is called as the resource holding capacity of a particular male. That means uh, a male will not be giving up, you know, uh, if a rival male finds out that a certain male which is next to him, which is at a good spot for getting a female, uh, you know, and that particular male is probably a smaller male based on the calls that the male is hearing, there will be a competition like what you have seen in the video, like a male will come and they will have a combat and they will uh, try to uh, remove that particular male from that particular area by you know physically involving in a fight. So that kind of assessment also happens via, uh, you know, the vocalization which the species produce. So all of these, uh, uh, you know, this is how, you know, you know, uh, Acoustic signaling is one of the most important aspect of sexual selection in amphibians. You know, there are species which are also known to have visual communication, but majority of the species, this works based on the, uh, the sound. So, you know, I mean, it is very clear. You all know that amphibians are nocturnal. So uh, technically seeing each other in many species, you know, many majority of amphibians are nocturnal. So seeing each other in, uh, in, in amphibians may not be the, uh, you know, the thing that a species can do. You know, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So uh, it's at night, so visually they cannot see each other. So they are just trying to find their way to the right partner based on the sound that they're hearing. That is one important aspect that you can understand why sounds are very important in amphibians. So it basically regulates uh, everything that is happening in an amphibian mating system. Um, the species in the picture uh, is uh, our Indian toad, um, Bufo. Uh, sorry, Datafrenus. Right now, we call them as Datafrenus. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I was giving you an idea about how, uh, you know, the various types of call and how receivers and, uh, uh, and the signalers, uh, you know, function in amphibian system. And what, what all, so now I, since it's a, you know, I want to give you an idea about how uh, we, we study these uh, sounds. So that is an important aspect of this particular, you know, um, talk that I wanted to discuss. It's a, it's a kind of a workshop. So it gives you an insight on what exactly, uh, you know, you can do to study uh, vocalization in amphibians. Uh, the species in the picture is not an Indian species. Again, it's a species from Borneo. I mean, I just want to point out because uh, majority of the species that you see on my slides are from India, but sometimes uh, I use a picture from somewhere else where I worked just to you know show the diversity and the types of frogs which are there in the world. So this is a fee hyla from Borneo. So uh, vocal behavior in amphibians. So like I want to discuss uh, how you know you can prepare yourself for uh, you know if you want to do field studies in amphibians. So what is important here? So I'll tell you each aspect of uh, studying uh, acoustics in amphibians, whatever we can do through this uh, online discussion. Uh, like, like uh, you need to have uh, you know a good recording unit, which is like currently we use digital solid state recorders uh, with uh, directional microphones, and uh, you know, uh, when I can easily tell you the reasons why, because directional microphones basically will help you get the mail that you are intended to record. You know, you want to avoid any kind of background noise that is existing. I mean, as I was telling you that frogs can call in loud choruses. So you want to record only that particular individual because otherwise you won't be able to study the vocalization. So you want to record a particular individual. You need to have a microphone which can actually uh, point in a certain direction and will avoid the noise which is coming from other sides so that you can focus on the individual that you are recording. So uh, that is that is what you are going to get a quality output while you are uh, you know trying to record these uh, frogs in the field. Uh, we require directional headphones. So then you have noise proof headphones. So what is the function of uh, a noise proof headphone? Uh, what it does is that you are also monitoring the individual whether you know for example at night you're working and if uh, the light of 
your headlamp, which you're using to study frogs, uh, disturbs the animal. So what you will do here? Here in this case, you will have to turn off your light and sit quietly a little far away from the calling male and position your uh, uh, microphones close to the animal and move a bit, go back and wait for the animal to call. And that is when the headphone helps you. So what, what it does is that uh, if a male that you are intended to record, if it calls, uh, it can actually tell you, you can easily hear it through your ear, whether the frog is calling because you're already using a directional phone. So you're pointing at a particular species. So noise proofing will always help you and you will know whether you have uh, uh, a right uh, kind of male, like the male that you want to record is calling. In other way, if, if other males are calling in the vicinity, you may not hear that those sound coming through your headphones because your microphones won't pick that up. That is one aspect. Second uh, aspect of noise proof headphone is that whether you are getting the right output while you're recording or not. You know, you can always check your recorder where what kind of uh, the levels of the records that you are listening to, uh, you know, through your headphones, whether it is coming out properly. So you can also do real time monitoring using these headphones without light. And you can easily check into the quality of the sounds that you have actually recorded through your headphones because you are directly hearing it and you're not hearing anything because noise proofing helps. Right. Uh, then um, okay. So that was about the recording. You know, once we record, uh, we have to look into these uh, parameters of the animal also. So, um, like, we need to get the morphological parameters of the animal. Like, uh, generally, a recording is not considered as useful if you're not able to catch that particular individual and take its measurements, like, you know, snout to vent length, which is SPL and the mass of that animal, because the vocalization, as we were discussing earlier, also the vocalization of the species depends on the body size of that particular uh, um, species. So, uh, you know, you want to know how, uh, you know, all of these information that we were talking about earlier, that how a female uh, choose a mate and also you can understand one thing that whether uh, in that particular species, uh, body size, which is SPL and mass is correlated with the frequency of the animal. So all of this information you can only calculate when you have those measurements. So and physical parameter that like temperature, which is also important because, uh, uh, you know, we have we measure both spectral and temporal properties and temporal properties are correlated with temperature so what you want to do is that you can always check whether your acoustic parameter varies with temperature or not so that helps you get the you know right uh, you, you can always stand with the help of temperature you can always standardize the acoustic parameters of the animal or species that you're working on so i mean i i can explain it uh, in the coming uh, slide yeah so uh, before i go to that aspect i can just tell you what are the various precautions that you can take while you're recording the animal like you know you should always try and see whether you have any background noise you know sometimes there could be frog just sitting behind the male that you're trying to record so in that case the microphone won't help you right so just behind the microphone that you want to use so that is avoid black background noise so be very careful about the males that you choose you should always try to find a male which is a bit isolated so that even your microphone works properly based on like you know, when you're trying to do the field work. Sample size is important. I know uh, normally you can see uh, you cannot quantify acoustic properties of the species by just recording one call of a one frog. No, because there are a lot lo loud varieties of sound which an amphibian may produce. So you can, you know, try and get as many number of calls from the individual and study various individuals of that particular species to actually know the acoustic parameters of that particular species. So sample size is a very important aspect. That means you should always avoid, uh, you know, uh, trying to say that you know, one frog of one individual of a species, it's not actually the representative of that species. So that kind of aspect is always there. I mean, you can always use it for a reference. OK, so one individual, you can always tell that you know, that will help you identify the species. But I mean, studying what we call as vocal behavior, you need large sample size. I mean, obviously, even if you have one sample of a species, it actually is a call of that particular species only. It may not be uh, 
everything that a species might be producing, but it is a species. It will represent the species. But when you say vocal behavior, you need to study it very properly. So when then, and that is the time when you need to have a bigger sample size, right? Then uh, while you know recorders will tell you how what are your record levels, you know you should not um, record at a very low level. So all of these factors are important. Like you know, so set your record level property and also. Another important aspect here is that when you are trying to set your record level, you should not be recording at that time. Right. So you can only record a frog after you have set the record level and it should not change while you're recording. So uh, it should be maintained like the record levels of the recording unit should be maintained all throughout the recording. You cannot manipulate while you're recording. So that won't give you the right values. So it's like manipulating the sound. So if you change the record levels while you're recording. So as I have already pointed out, real time monitoring is your headphones should be on your head, you know, especially for beginners, which, uh, you know, we need to know how to do this uh, recording properly. So you need to monitor it very properly uh, through your headphones and see whether you are getting the right quality of sound in your ear or not, the males that you're looking for, you know, whether you're getting a single male, you know, single male sound is very important here because if you, uh, you know, record two, three males simultaneously, the recording is messed up. You can't study any kind of aspects of those calls. Uh, always protect your equipments because frogs are calling in the monsoon. And, and uh, yeah, I've already talked about the gain settings of the recorder. So early on, when you were talking about the record levels, uh, moving on to the next aspect, yeah. So this is an image which shows a recording which is not useful for scientific studies and the other one which is ideal. What is there in that recording we can clearly see through the picture is the first one on the top. I mean, I'm just showing you the visuals of the sound that you hear using softwares. So uh, the top one that you see is a mixture of um, maybe two species or uh, you can see um, it's an overlap. Maybe there are two individuals which were calling simultaneously, or there were two species of frogs, or, and there was a lot of background noise. All of this thing, which and also the amplitude of the call that you see is very small, uh, short uh, compared to the calls that you see and the in, in below. So, so, top one is not suitable for scientific studies. The ideal situation is when you get a recording like which you have below. So, when I mean, that's something that you need to see. Uh, while you want to study uh, acoustics in amphibians. Uh, yeah, another important aspect is analyzing these uh, sounds. Uh, this is another important aspect. So, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, before I start uh, giving you ideas about sound analysis, uh, one thing I need to point out, like in frogs, we study uh, two kinds of uh, call properties, that is the temporal and the spectral uh, properties. So temporal properties are like you know based on time, and spectral property is the frequency that I was talking about. So we study a lot of temporal properties, and uh, all of these temporal property is not like standard for all species of frogs. So when you are analyzing a particular species, you need to look into So when you are analyzing a particular species, uh, you need to look into what all temporal properties you can study from that particular species. So what I'm trying to show here is a generalized version, but it may not be applicable to all species of frogs. You know, that is something that you need to understand in the beginning because uh, uh, every species, as I have already mentioned, is having unique vocal repertoire. So um, you cannot apply the same principle on all the frogs. So you need to understand one thing very clearly that First, you need to, uh, you know, whatever your data you have, you need to go through and see whether uh, what kind of call parameters you can study from that particular recording, which will vary from species to species, right? So uh, this is a very important aspect, right? So I'm just trying to give you an overall picture of, uh, you know, giving one example of a species where, um, you know, we have a hierarchical organization of calls. So this is one thing that you can see on the screen. So we see here is bout, interbout interval, uh, group duration. There are some power properties that you see highlighted on the screen. So I'll tell you what is about. Bout means uh, if an animal is uh, calling in a certain pattern, right? You know, uh, like a male starts, it calls, it stops. Uh, it has, you know, um, 
from the beginning to the end, you can consider it as one bout because it's taking a proper break and then it will restart again. So within those bouts, if they deliver calls which are delivered simultaneously, we can group them together and call it as a call group. So we also calculate the duration of those call groups. And the difference, time difference between these bouts would be interbout interval. And there would be groups of calls. We call them as intergroup intervals. So this is a hierarchical organization of calls. Yeah, but this is not the major uh, temporal property. Uh, this is just to show the hierarchical organization of calls which a species may have or may not have. As I said, all species have their own uh, unique vocal repertoire. Then you have uh, so this is about the calls. Uh, you can see the screen. Uh, you have call duration, and you can see intercall interval, call rise, call fall. So uh, call duration is basically uh, time from the beginning to the end of the call. One of the most simple parameters which everybody knows. Like you know, you can see it on the screen. Difference between two calls is uh, intercall interval. So in calls, you will see pulses, which has a certain pattern. Like you know, it goes up, and then it comes down. So from the beginning to where it reaches at the maximum, and then from sometimes it stays like that for a while, and then again it falls. So that is what we call as call fall time. So all of these parameters uh, uh, you know, tells you uh, the unique acoustic property that a frog may have. So it, again, varies from species to species. Uh, even within individuals in a species, it will vary because you know that it's a very important. Some of these parameters are very important for uh, mate choice selections. So uh, within a particular species, also these uh, frogs will try to uh, manipulate many of these acoustic parameters just to try and look more uh, attractive for a female. So, so that's why we need to know many of these parameters if you want to study them properly in future and understand their behavior and why it is happening. So this is how you will do it. So uh, yeah, again, um, this is another important uh, acoustic parameter. We're talking about the pulses. You know, calls are comprised of small, small pulses. In many cases, you will not find pulses also. Again, this is a species specific. Some species will have pulse, maybe will not. Again, uh, you can see a very clear image of a pulse of a particular species. So it, what it tells you that you need to have a recording of that quality. So all the precautions that I told in the beginning, you cannot have this kind of uh, image coming out from your recording if you don't record the frogs properly. You will have a lot of distortions, a lot of echoes in the background. If you have a lot of individuals calling together, you will never get an image like this to understand pulse properties. So this is an important aspect. So these are some of the pulse properties that uh, uh, that gets analyzed, like pulse duration, period, rise, and fall time. So it tells you, uh, you know, how a pulse is shaped in a particular species. So uh, you know, you get. I mean, I'm again telling, repeating it. Like you get these kind of uh, information only when your recording is good. So spectral property, like uh, this image shows uh, uh, frequency of a particular species. Like uh, in this case, uh, the frog is calling between a frequency of 2.5 to 3 uh, kilohertz. You can easily see from the picture. So sometimes it's very simple. But there are species which will manipulate the frequency just to sound more attractive to a male. So a lot of things you can study You know, when you are studying these acoustics. So again, as it's all species specific. This is just an example. So you will have to understand how these acoustic parameters, you can utilize it for your own analysis. Sometimes you will have multiple bands like this. As you see, only one band is there in this species. You will have multiple bands in certain species. So all of these factors will tell you, uh, you know, it will be unique for uh, species. You know, when you are studying these uh, acoustics, and so another, uh, you know, this is an important aspect. Uh, so as we, I mean, I was telling you in the beginning that uh, a female can also use this information to choose the partner because uh, a larger male will have lower dominant frequency. A smaller male would have a higher dominant frequency. So uh, it's inversely proportional. So uh, you know, a lot of information comes out from spectral properties. Uh, yeah, and another important aspect, I told you to take the temperatures properly. Like I was telling you in the beginning that we need to have the information about the temperature at which the individuals have been recorded. Like Because uh, it's another important aspect. Because uh, temporal properties vary very uh, you know, 
a lot based on the temperature. Like for example, I can give you one temporal property like pulse rate. So if you are uh, uh, if you're recording a frog, in a in a in a you know it can be directly proportional with the temperature. Like, uh, uh, like higher temperatures, you will have faster pulse rates. Lower temperature, you have lower pulse rates. So, uh, like I can show you one image. So here you can see it's uh, you know directly proportional to uh, temperature of the wet bulb. So um, what we do is, in order to standardize it, we do something called as temperature corrections. We are using this linear mathematical equation. You know, you know, y equal to m x plus c. M, m is the slope. So you calculate M and then you correct the temperature, then you can see a flat line. That means you have corrected the acoustic properties and uh, you have standardized the call properties of a particular species. When you publish, it becomes more exact representative it will, because it will em eliminate the effect of temperature which the call individuals might have. So I can just give you an example of pulse rate, so which varies a lot based on the temperature. Yeah. Sometimes the screen freezes. I don't know. Um, yeah, sound analysis. Uh, what we after doing all of these analysis, we report them, uh, which we call as quantitative description of call. You can understand you have a large sample size. You are recording multiple individuals, and uh, uh, you are uh, trying to uh, show what exactly represents the species. So that is uh, we that is what we call as quantitative description of calls. So, you know, you need to have a larger sample size, multiple calls multiple number of individuals and uh, then you need to uh, um, you know uh, present it uh, by doing temperature correction so that you can eliminate the factors which might be affecting the call properties so that is uh, something that like normally when you see a paper of acoustic description it you will see these things happening in those papers then we also report the values of uh, svl mass temperature and body conditions correlation uh, with the acoustic properties. So uh, all of these things uh, tells you what exactly is there present in that particular species. You can see spectral properties uh, varying with uh, body mass and uh, um, snout to vent length of that particular individual in most of the species. Temporal properties varying with temperature. So all of these values you can always report and that's why you, uh, you, know, you get a you know, good correlation analysis. So what exactly is affecting the acoustic properties of these uh, frogs? So that was that is normally you will see in any basic acoustic description paper you will find these kind of information there. Of uh, you know you will see that. So I mean I can just show you some examples uh, like some important studies in kind of studies which is based on acoustics. Like you study vocal behavior, which is the most prominent one. Uh, then you study you know, taxonomists use it for uh, systematic revision or integrative taxonomy. It is used for conservation. So these are important aspects uh, of uh, you know, kinds of work which, and as I've already pointed out, uh, you know, some other aspects you can see is that uh, you know, it's a very important aspect in conservation. So I want to highlight it once again. So it can be easily used as a tool for determining the presence and absence of species in a given area. Like you know a species whether it is there in a particular area, because if it is there, it will make a sound. If it is a frog which is known to vocalize, it will definitely be making sound during their uh, breeding season. So uh, you can easily use it as a tool to determine the presence and absence. So you can, uh, for example, in India, the biggest problem is, uh, uh, I hope you are aware of one important thing that most of our species have been discovered in the last decade. So it is well known, like, you know, our discoveries, or maybe in the last 15 years. So we have almost doubled the number of species that we have in the, our country. So, uh, so if you go through all the literatures, you will find that species have been reported from type localities, right? You don't see, uh, uh, you know, then people say that you need to find the species in that they, those areas which taxonomists have published, but uh, that may not be the case. Sometimes those species can be present in other areas also, and uh, uh, it's just that you are not aware of it at that point of time. So uh, acoustic monitoring can also help you uh, find other areas. So if you have the data for the sound for a particular species, you can actually go to other areas and survey, do random surveys to understand what exactly is the diversity of that particular area. Because 
uh, that's a very important method. So you can easily map the species in other areas as well. It may be very helpful in conserving the species. Sometimes you declare a species as a critically endangered frog uh, without, uh, um, it may not be critically endangered, or sometimes it could be the other way around, both the cases. So because we are not aware of exactly where these species are distributed, because we don't have, uh, you know, and again, one important thing is here is that you cannot go and sample all the areas and see the genetics of the species, uh, like molecular analysis of the species to identify the species all the time. It's a very uh, expensive process. You need to do a lot of field work and lab work uh, to get these information. But if you have uh, acoustic information, uh, it gives you, it, we consider it as a non-invasive method. You know, non-invasive means it doesn't disturb animal. You can just go to the place, hear the sound, uh, maybe record it, and try to compare it with the data that you already have, whether it is that particular species or something else. So it gives you a preliminary information, which is very strong, because as I've already pointed out, signals, acoustic signals are uh, species specific. So it gives us one of the best uh, method of identifying, especially for morphologically cryptic species, which can look very similar, but uh, um, maybe completely different animal. So, so uh, it's very important. So that's why I'm trying to highlight it again and again. Uh, in the beginning, I was telling you uh, it can be used for doing evolutionary studies. Uh, evolutionary studies is like, you know, people do it for various things. You know, I have, like, you know, we, I've already highlighted many aspects of uh, how you can do it. You know, uh, sound basically serves as a pre mating, uh, reproductive isolation. So you can have the, you know, phylogeny and you can see how signals have evolved in that particular group, whether it has diverged, converged many aspects of uh, uh, these yeah, you, you know, evolutionary biology study. Uh, if you want to study these, uh, you know, you can do it as a tool. You know, it's a very important aspect. Um, frogs are a very important model because, I mean, um, I've already highlighted. So again, I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, go to the next slide now, uh, which is like, what is the scenario of India right now? I mean, uh, so it's an important thing to understand here because uh, if you look at uh, the Indian context right now, we don't have uh, acoustic information for majority of the species, right? And uh, the reason being very simple, uh, acoustic work is still it like an infancy stage in India. Like, like it's, uh, it's hardly been done. We have proper vocal behavior studies for only a few handful of species from our country. And uh, you may have records of species in taxonomic publications which uh, helps taxonomists identify a particular species. So that, that via that also you have some acoustic information of a particular species. So, but it may not be uh, all of the species. So we, we still, uh, we are still trying to, uh, you know, understand the vocalizations of uh, multiple species. And it's a, it's a, it's an open field because you, like, you know, as I said, it's, it requires a lot of field work a lot of information you need to go out in the field and collect the information and try and understand what is the, uh, you know, various kinds of vocalization that species will produces. You quantify it, publish it, you know, do these kind of uh, analysis uh, to show uh, what kind of, uh, you know, whether it is following the trend that is already published in the literature or you can do a nice comparison with the species which are existing. So multiple options are open. Like uh, it's, a, it's a new field, emerging field. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean uh, if you look at it, there is a lot of scope in this particular subject, you know, people uh, should pick up, it's a, it's a very important field. And it is, since we are living in an age of uh, species decline and extinction, you are hearing every day that there are species which uh, are getting wiped out and, and even amphibians, which are considered to be the most threatened group of vertebrates in the world, which with more than uh, one third of uh, species which might face extinction in the near future because of various reasons. So having information and monitoring them properly, this kind of information like acoustics would be very, very helpful, especially for our country, because we uh, we also have a huge, huge diversity of more than 400 and around 430 species right now that we have in our country. So, I mean, we don't know. It keeps on increasing every year. Many species get published and uh, Sometimes you see some acoustic data, sometimes you don't see that. 
but having those information is always helpful and uh, you know collecting those information from the field and you know uh, dissipating the information about that particular species would be a very important tool uh, to save or help uh, conservation of our uh, indian amphibians as well so you know with that i want to uh, conclude because uh, i mean that's what i have prepared for the if you have any any uh, like um, so I want to, uh, like in the end, I want to thank uh, for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank the faculty coordinator, Dr. Ramamurthy uh, Abhinav, who contacted me, and also uh, all the stu students present here and other faculty members and other uh, listeners for uh, patiently listening to the uh, you know, amphibian talk. And uh, I, if you have any queries or question, uh, I would like to answer anything that uh, uh, you you want to hear? Yes, thank you so much, sir. The talk was really um, engaging, and uh, it was a lot to understand. Um, shortly, I will go back and read more about this to get a better idea. Um, I think we have a few questions in the chat box. Um, can I read it out to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you, sir. Okay, so the first question is by Rahul. He asks, how can we estimate the abundance and monitor population by any of the passive acoustic survey methods? Uh, I'm not getting the question. Can you repeat it? How can we estimate the abundance and monitor population by any of the passive acoustic survey methods? Uh, what do you mean by passive? Uh, and, uh, like if uh, frogs are not Rahul's calling? I think Rahul can is here. If he wants, he can ask the question himself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, if he can unmute himself and yeah, uh, yes, sir, Rahul. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thanks for the talk, sir. It was really engaging. Yeah, passive in the sense like uh, non-invasive. I just want to like without without any uh, harming or disturbance to the species. Okay, okay. So yeah. what what I was trying to tell is uh, if you are having an idea about the sounds of the species. Uh, you can easily go to the field and using that information, you can, without disturbing the animal, like you can, I mean, you just have to use your ears and recorders to understand what kind of animal would be present in that particular area. So that is something which always helps. I mean, yeah, uh, for me, it has been very helpful in finding frogs uh, wherever uh, I do field work because uh, um, I have relatively good idea about the sounds that I hear, like, you know the species and all because i've been working on them for a lot of time so it helps me track these animals and go and locate uh, species which might be uh, present uh, in that particular area so i mean uh, it just doesn't disturb the animal right you know you go and you see the frog and you can record them and uh, tell them by their sound that uh, you know it is this species that you have found so it's very easy as i was talking about it's very easy so have i answered your question yeah, so we'll, we'll be able to find the abundance or we can monitor the population with respect to yes. time. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The, okay. the, this, okay. is, this is uh, something that uh, you need to understand. Like, if you are having the information, you can easily, you know, I mean, sounds that you hear, you can always estimate what kind of uh, population would be because uh, almost all the males uh, produces call during the breeding season. So, and uh, males are the majority in frogs. You know that sex ratio in frogs are very, uh, um, they have a very small uh, skewed uh, sex ratio. Like males are more mostly in amphibians and females would be less in number. So, you know, we call them as operational sex ratio, which is uh, the number of males to uh, the responsive females. The number of males are always higher. So they are putting in a lot of effort to attract a mate like based on their sounds, which basically tells their genetic fitness. So you can always have a good idea about how many number of males is calling in that particular area if you have the acoustic information. So that kind of, uh, you know, uh, this is something that you can expect in the field. And if the population is declining, you will know all the time when you monitor the population. Like, you know, if you go to a certain area every year, you will know eventually that uh, what kind of uh, um, situation uh, is that particular species is in that particular area because you are trying to monitor so it's not like you will listen 
uh, find out within one year. You will have to do a long-term study to understand whether it is going up or down. All of these uh, things will eventually come to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Astha. She asks, uh, due to anthropogenic noises, frogs face problems during their mate season. And I have read that some have recently evolved to mate only when, they, when there is no noise nearby. So are there any mechanisms which have been evolved to overcome this? Um, see. Um sometimes uh, like we have a lot of studies especially from europe which has shown that uh, uh, species do get disturbed by uh, noise which is there in their uh, vicinity especially anthropogenic noise if we are doing some kind of activities next to there so sometimes species if they're living and if they're there in for a long period of time they also tend to adapt uh, try and adapt to those conditions sometimes uh, some species may not adapt to that condition so it depends on the species in those cases so uh, they alter their uh, you know calling frequencies and stuff like that it has been known so that uh, you know they can survive in those areas and successfully mate over a period of time so all of these factors are there it does disturb the animals which is uh, uh, like trying to breed and if it is and like for example it is also understood that uh, the, like for example uh, noises near the breeding habitat also tends to disorient you know females which are looking for the right partner so all of these uh, factors do exist you know all of these problems do exist in the yeah, uh, in amphibian breeding uh, system so if we have an anthropogenic noise they can you can easily uh, uh, study all of these things i mean we don't have any of these kind of studies which have been done in india but yeah it's a, it's, it's something which is open you know we do have frogs which breeds next to uh, anthropogenic noise in our country I mean, I'm just talking based on the examples that you can come across from other countries and other researchers, which has been published. So they show that it gets impacted by uh, anthropogenic noise if it is there next to their breeding habitat. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by Swastik. He asks, sir, in a frog chorus, how do females differentiate and locate the superior male when there is an overlapping of certain call parameters? Um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Sorry. Sir, in a frog chorus, how do females differentiate and locate the superior male when there is an overlapping of certain call parameters? Yeah, I mean, uh, see, um, when you do acoustic studies, you quantify uh, various call properties of a particular frog. I was just trying to explain uh, that uh, in various species, females tend to look at different aspects, right? So uh, what happens uh, in frogs is uh, you, as a researcher, you will go out and quantify various call properties and try to tell that this is how the frog calls. But experimental studies have shown that females only look for maybe one or two or three of those properties that you have studied, which becomes important for them to select a right mate. It's not that everything that we try and publish, it's just like we are just trying to standardize for our own use, like identification. Females have their own uh, specific. Plus, interestingly, you have to know one more thing. Even when you look at a female hearing ability, they also have a very narrow range of uh, uh, you know, hearing ability. Like you know, the dominant frequency which they can listen to is also having a narrow range. So uh, many of these factors are taken into account. And, uh, and the parameters that I just talked about, like uh, um, call complexity or uh, um, average values uh, or maybe uh, males which are larger which dominant frequency tells them so in a, in a breeding choruses uh, uh, these are many of these parameters for different species they will have different kinds of aspect which the female would be looking at so uh, that's what uh, um, I mean that's what helps a species identify its right mate or right partner you know uh, like and females are very choosy in amphibians as i've already mentioned sex ratio which is uh, plenty of males would be there and very less number of females would be there so yeah 
if uh, there are any other questions the participants you can please uh, drop it in in the chat box uh, until they do i have a question sir yeah. so i just wanted to know about uh, what kinds of uh, softwares or applications should we make ourselves familiar with when we are working with uh, analyzing uh, the recordings of frogs or... oh, okay so the softwares that i use is uh, like you know it's a cornell uh, university's software raven i don't know whether okay. you've heard of it or not it's raven uh and the name suggests uh, like it's raven is a bird so yeah so uh, it works very well with the frogs so it can do all kinds of sound analysis that's what i do and i'm familiar with and uh, the good thing is that they uh, provide uh, to indians uh, for free if you ask them if you send a proper mail and the reasons why you want the software uh they will give you the software for free so uh, people who wants to work on these aspects uh they can easily uh you know um, get these softwares okay so that's like a great information that will that yeah. hopefully all of us can look into um yeah. thank you sir i just want to tell all the participants um uh, to not to forget to fill the feedback forms and uh, i think we don't have oh okay there's one question just one minute yeah so the question is uh, hello sir great talk um have you ever encountered satellite mails during choruses i've read about how they eavesdrop on the calls of dominant males to mate with females yeah i mean that's very interesting actually the those males are more smarter right they are just waiting for the right opportunity so uh, many times uh, if you look at the studies on amphibian system uh, uh satellite males uh, just sit uh, you know so all the job is being done by the male which is producing the sound and uh, the male actually finds uh, you know in this case you know understand that the male actually is aware about where the female would be going and like they will sit as a satellite next to those species and uh, if a female is moving towards that particular male he can just uh, you know get into an amplexus and confuse the female also right now something like that happens in those systems so uh, that means uh, in those species uh, uh, they have a i mean this males who are quiet and they are not doing anything actually to attract a female would be more smarter right because they are getting the benefit without doing anything so that is also happening in amphibian system so it's very unique you know that amphibian mating systems we have more than 40 different ways by which they breed you cannot tell any uh, group of animals uh, like that in the world look it's one of the most unique uh, kind of uh, uh, you know things that you experience with them while you work with frogs so they have so much to tell you and they breed in so many different ways that uh, it it's always surprising the people who are studying them like you know you will always find something which is not known in uh, like you know when you look at study them properly yeah Okay, there's one more question. Um, in concentration to Raksha's question on software, what all entry-level hardware devices are required for survey? Hardware devices means I'm not getting recording like recording device. I guess recording uh, devices. Uh, in... You can buy a lot of uh, digital solid-state recorders. Like uh, I, we use, I have used a lot of them, and uh, most of them are good. Like uh, you have uh, Marans. you have a uh, um fostex you have uh, um you have uh, zoom zoom is also a very good recorder and uh, in terms of microphones you have sennheisers that make very good uh, directional microphones uh, which is uh, you know we have sennheiser me 66 67 and then 416 which is very expensive which is also really good like uh, but yeah i mean uh, these are all are the equipments which are handy and headphones you will always find a lot of noise cancellation headphones which is available randomly in the market for various companies which can help you uh, monitor the frogs while you are studying them yeah um 
Okay, so I think uh, that's about it, the questions that we have. Um, I just want to thank you again uh, for a really engaging and informative talk. Uh, I'm sure like all of us have a lot, learned a lot, but then uh, have more to read up on to uh, understand and uh, maybe implement this further on. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, being here and telling us about this. And uh, uh, we really look forward to hearing more. From and um, uh, there are many uh, compliments that's coming in the chat box saying how the talk was very informative. I just want to thank on behalf of all the other participants also. I want to thank the faculty members. I want to th thank Dr. Ramuthi sir for being here. And I want to thank the participants for being so cooperative uh, throughout the whole session. So uh, thank you so much, sir, for being here. And um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's about it. Thank you for inviting. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. A wonderful session we had, really. At the young age, Rabinji uh, visited foreign countries, has done sir, many experimental work. The knowledge occurred, and the information genuinely identified in the field brought the information in form of intelligence, in fact. Yes. Completely exposed to the wonderful session we have that is worldwide uh, 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 celebration we are doing. That really, it is a wonderful opportunity for me to have here such kind of a splendid uh, lecture. I must, I am thankful to Rabinji. I must be thankful to uh, students, uh, uh, team organizers. So I am very much happy, uh, pressure of mine to have with you. Uh, thanks for having invited me. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, yeah. Thank you, sir. Hope you have a nice day. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. The same, yeah. The same. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah.